We've now seen how we can represent graphically both parts of the firm's short-run profit maximization problem. The constraint is what the firm can produce given its current technology and it's represented by the short-run production function that holds capital fixed at its current level. The thing we're trying to maximize, profit, can be represented by a whole map of profit lines where profit increases as we move to the northwest in this graph. So just like with consumers, we have a whole map of lines that the firm is indifferent between. With consumers, we had a whole indifference map with lots of indifference curves. What the consumer tried to do was get to the highest possible indifference curve given the budget constraint they faced. What the firm is trying to do is get to the highest profit line given the technological constraint they face in their short-run production function. So we could imagine, for example, starting with the zero profit line. So if we put the zero profit line in here, we have all the combinations of labor and output that result in zero profit. Then we can ask, can the firm do better than that? And since there are points available above this blue line that are technologically feasible, we know the firm can do better than that. So the firm's going to move to a higher profit line, and it's going to keep moving to a higher profit line, just like consumers kept moving to a higher indifference curve, until it can't move any further. That'll result in a point of tangency, just as we saw in the case of consumers. But now we have labor and output. The constraint, instead of a budget constraint, is the short-run production function. And the final profit line, the highest profit line you can get to, will be one that reaches a point of tangency, like this. Once we get to this point, we can't move any further northwest, because everything up here is not technologically feasible. Now at that tangency, two slopes are equal to each other, just like they were for consumers. And we know what those slopes are. The slope of the short-run production function is just the marginal product of labor. So the slope here is the marginal product of labor. So this marginal product of labor is going to be equal to the slope of the profit line. And the slope of the profit line is W over P, wage over price. So at the profit maximizing production plan, it has to be true that the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage divided by the price. Now we can multiply this through and say that that's equivalent to saying that price times marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. And we have a word for this. We call this the marginal revenue product of labor, the additional revenue I get from hiring one more worker. So we're going to keep hiring workers so long as the marginal revenue product of labor, the additional revenue I get from the worker, is greater than the wage would I have to pay the worker. So what would that look like in a graph where we graph the marginal revenue product of labor curve? Well, we saw that the way to do that is to put dollars on this axis. Marginal revenue product is measured in dollars. And we saw that that curve, just like the marginal product of labor curve, reaches its peak at this inflection point. So we get some curve that looks like this. That's equal to marginal revenue product of labor, or price times marginal product of labor. And since we're measuring dollars on this axis, and wage is measured in dollars, we can measure the wage on this axis as well. So wherever the wage is, we get a point where the marginal revenue product represented by this curve is equal to the wage. So that would tell me that this is how many workers the firm should hire if it wants to maximize its profit. Let's see if that makes sense. For the first workers I hire, the marginal revenue product of labor 
is relatively low. They're not producing very much revenue for me. In fact, they're producing less than what they cost me because the wage is what they cost me. So I'm actually losing money on these first few workers. But that's okay because once I get to this worker, each additional worker is earning more additional revenue for me than what the worker costs me in terms of the wage. So we're going to make up these initial losses by gains in here. And we're going to keep hiring those workers until what they cost me becomes equal to the revenue that they produce. At that point, I don't want to hire any more because if I hired any more workers, the additional revenue I get is less than what those workers cost me. So that's why this actually makes sense. Now we should point out that there is another point at which the price times marginal product of labor is equal to the wage here. But we wouldn't want to stop hiring workers here because if we stopped here, we would have just hired the workers that produced less additional revenue for me than what they cost me. So we'd make a negative profit in here. And you can see that in the upper picture, there's actually a second profit line that's tangent to this production function. It's one that is tangent down here. Right? We have lots of parallel profit lines. There's another one that's tangent down here but it has a negative intercept. In other words, if we chose this production plan, we would be making negative profit. Well, that production plan is equivalent to this, hiring this amount of labor. This production plan is equivalent to this profit maximizing production plan. So we can then make sense of this condition that emerges from this tangency it simply says that we're going to keep hiring workers so long as what they earn us in addition is greater than what they cost us in addition to what we are paying so far. The final thing we can do is we can go back to the math and say, well, does the same thing come out of this problem if we just solve it? So one way to solve this is to take the constraint and just substitute it into the Thing we're trying to optimize. So just substitute it in for x. Then profit would be equal to price times the production function, what it gives us when we hire a certain amount of labor given our fixed capital, minus WL. That gives us the profit for different amounts of labor that we hire. It gives us a profit mountain and the profit will be maximized when we're at the top of that mountain. So when the slope of that mountain is zero. So we can take the derivative of this, the derivative of profit with respect to labor, and we want to set that equal to zero. That's where profit is going to be the highest it can possibly be. So taking derivative of this, we get price times the derivative of the short-run production function with respect to labor, which is a partial derivative, minus w. And that has to be equal to zero. But we know what the partial derivative of f with respect to l is. That's just equal to the marginal product of labor. So we can rewrite this now as just the, the price times the marginal product of labor substitute in for the partial of f with respect to l, and take w to the other side, add it to both sides of the equation, to get e is that that's equal to w. So the math gives us exactly the same condition that we see emerging from the picture when we just reach the highest profit line that we can while still remaining within what's technologically feasible.